Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season here today with your hosts, Lisa and Venkat. How's it going, Venkat? Hey, Lisa. So today we are doing R, right? R for risk. Mm, I assume you mean R-I-S-C, risk as in risk processors? Oh, uh, (laughs) no, Venkat. We're talking about like risky business. Um, What kind of risks have you taken this last week? What kind of risks have I taken this last week? I've said not just last week, but in we're coming up on the end of the first quarter. And I think I've said no to more sort of inbound consulting gigs um, more often this year than ever before. Like I've said no like a dozen times to, like I would say six or seven times to gigs and four or five times to other kinds of opportunities, like interviews and stuff. And I don't know what's going on with me. And that's risky. It's not like I'm in a comfortable position where I can afford to keep saying no. And uh, sort of, uh, it's not like I'm sitting on uh, huge deal flows where things will happen anyway. So yeah, I'm taking a risk there. So I'm not quite sure why, but that's the risk I took last week or Mm -hmm. last quarter. What about you? Yeah, uh, what kind of risk have I been taking? I feel like I've been doing risky things with, I don't know, um, cash flow a little bit, not really, but like I just dumped a bunch of money on some house improvements. Um, hmm. my, my strategy for paying them off is a little bit of like returns on Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> I think that's a little risky. If, if Bitcoin goes to like zero tomorrow, I'm going to be in some trouble, but. Uh, so, uh, wait, uh, this reminds me of something I was talking about with my friend Carlos, where he was talking about the home improvements and how um, sort of cosmetic uh, improvements, kind of speaking to your idea of quality last week or a couple of weeks ago, uh, where if you put on like granite countertops or something, it increases the house value quite a lot, but it's like a cheap um, addition. Whereas if you do really expensive remodifications of like kitchens and bathrooms, you don't get as much of a return on the risk, I guess, right? Yep. So yeah, what yep. kinds of improvements are you making? Uh, I'm getting, I'm doing the dumb kind, which means not a good return on investment at all. Um, uh, it's a, Yeah, I'm, I'm installing new windows. It's going to help with the, um, they're all single pane aluminum frames right now. I'm replacing them with um, double pane um, styrofoam, not styrofoam, <laughs> double pane um, fiberglass windows. Okay. So, so is this for insulation, the, better insulation and air really conditioning? inside, huh? Okay. Is it, does it do insulation, better heating and cooling? Yeah, a lot okay. better. Like a lot better. It's like really important here. And like most of the windows I have are a little leaky. So when we had the cold front come through a few months ago, um, my house lost all its heat. So. Oh yeah, we were talking about that. You were one of the lucky ones who happened to have like New York style clothing that could survive the cold, right? Yep, that's exactly yeah. right. I had lots of warm wool sweaters. I own wool objects, which is not a common thing to own in Texas. Yeah, like I thought it would be a joke when we were talking about it, but people literally died of cold, right? So yeah, <laughs> yeah, crazy. Like Houstonians don't, I mean, Texans in general don't have cold weather gear. You just don't. Like, I mean, what was it like the French died when there was like a heat wave that rolled through Europe a year or two ago? And like, it was like they just didn't have AC. Um, I feel like it's kind of the reverse with here. And, you know, we look at them and kind of laugh and be like, it's only like 95 degrees. What's wrong with them? Um, it's the same thing. So, so this is kind of. Um interesting like when we talk about risk in this particular situation you could argue that uh, the people who didn't prepare for this rare kind of winter weather <clears throat> they're the ones who took the risks right whether, <clears throat> whether they signed up for gritty and didn't sign off uh, till too late or whether they didn't have any woolen clothes or didn't have good insulation you could say they were taking risks against rare black swan events But on the other hand, you could also argue that the people who invested in that stuff are the ones taking risk because uh, it did not have a guaranteed return, right? Like somebody, you you kind of had the free option because you were coming from New York. But if you'd been in Texas all your life, would you have invested? I might have a ski jacket. I probably have, I've been skiing. So I had like in past winter events, you know, the one that happened 25 years ago or whatever, 
um it wasn't that long but uh I definitely had like a ski jacket and a ski outfit but that's about it um yeah so in a way you, we could say that you having lived in New York and moved back being prepared for cold weather was almost a free strategic option for you as I think uh, Ben Thompson puts it in his uh, strategy newsletter free option like you know <clears throat> like Apple makes a big deal of its posture of being like pro security and privacy and not like making everything encrypted but if you actually look into their business model it's kind of a free strategic option for them like they get yeah, a no risk uh, return on being big on uh, privacy and encryption right yeah. it's not actually a risk for them like google it would be an actual risk because the business model i think is more vulnerable to regulators coming after them on that front but apple is less so yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's like an investment I had to make to survive in New York City. And so I got to bring that investment down with me, which then became a free option in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. So you're in a way you'd already sort of recovered your investment right from a few winters in New York. So it was like you were in marginal profitable returns after that. Completely marginal. Yeah, that's true. Huh. Um, and I, I'm kind of hoping the window thing works out that way also just that like the livability improvement um, especially with like my house is really close to a busy road and it's really noisy because a lot of the existing stuff leaks and so when air moves through sound moves through um, so I'm sort of hoping that even though like on paper it's like not a great investment I probably won't get the cash back out if I sell the house but we'll see maybe house prices will skyrocket and the cost of windows will double from here in like five years from now so it actually is like a decent investment long term. Uh, but how long would you have to stay on. in the house? Uh, like if you wanted to actually recover the investment directly through like lower heating bills or something, how long would you have to stay in the house? <laughs> Probably like a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it, it, it's not going to pay for itself unless it appreciates the capital value of the house itself. Huh. which it's probably not I mean I, I understand like I understood going into it that it's probably a net loss but I'm excited about living in a house that's like a little bit nicer to live in so yeah and I think that's definitely worth it and also in a way it comes down to a thing is a risk depending on who is taking it like I, mm. I've been thinking about like um, Nassim Taleb's idea of skin in the game and I think there's something incomplete about that. It's not enough to have skin in the game. That skin must be sort of worth a certain fraction of um, sort of your risk capacity, right? Like if I have a hundred dollars and I bet a dollar on a lottery ticket, that's betting 1% of my net worth on the lottery. But if I have a thousand dollars and bet a dollar, that's the same risk from the outside, but from the inside, it's like one, I don't know, one tenth the risk or depending on the psychology, much less. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think like I can justify spending a lot of money on my house that I might not make back in that I didn't spend a lot of money on a house in the Bay Area. Um, so for me, when I look at like housing costs and stuff, it's like, well, I already saved a bunch of money here. So it doesn't really matter if I lose some money because like I'm still up net net personally for not having a house, like not mm -hmm. being, I don't know, I wouldn't say conned, but um conned into buying a house in the Bay Area. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's kind of an interesting point. Uh, say more about how you think about that, because I think you're, what you're getting at is the perception of risk, both internal and external, actually re is relative to the uh, reference point in, your, in the story you tell yourself. So in this case, the story you're telling yourself is, another alternative Lisa life that lived on in San Francisco and tried to buy there. Is that how you think about it? Yeah, exactly. Um, and I have friends that ended up buying places in San Francisco, but like, just like based on, you know, kind of where I am in my life and like cash flow, exactly. It would never would have been a good idea. Um, like, I like yeah. saved myself a lot of trouble by not having to save up for like a down payment on like a million dollar place or whatever, you know? Um, so the, a house is actually an interesting example of a kind of risk asset because most people buy zero or one, like the median number is zero and um, the next number up is one. Mm. Uh, and I think 
either zero or one makes it almost sort of a religious narrative decision for you. If you have a house or if you don't have a house, both of them have like extremely deep significance for you. Whereas it doesn't become sort of a utility commodity decision until you have two or more houses, right? Yeah, I think that's right. And most people don't ever get to the income level where you have multiple houses, really. Yeah. Um, and like actually, I don't have a house, but uh, it's still a religious decision for me to not have a house. And if I ever buy a house and it will be the only one, it will actually be a decision to a religious kind of decision. Yeah. And actually, like, to be honest, I think like part of the reason I decided to move to Texas and get a house is because I wanted to remove that religious consideration from my life to some extent. Because like, once you have a house, you don't have to really think about whether or not you're going to get a house anymore. Um, like, so... I, yeah, I just didn't trust myself with having to like continually keep thinking about it. So I took it out of the equation. I don't well, know. If that's you didn't to take it out of the equation. You just moved to the other side. So if it's a rent yeah. versus buy equation, you went to the buy side, but you still have a religious attitude towards home ownership, right? It's a big part of your identity now. I spent a Not lot of time thinking really. about modeling. I kind, of feel, I kind of feel like I live in an apartment. I mean, I get roommates just like my last apartment. I have to like manage to get the roommate. The last place I lived, I was also responsible for like helping organize maintenance for the guy who owned it. So like, yeah, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the capital risk and oh. uh, stuff. So you are the one on the hook for that, not the landlord, not some abstract yeah, landlord. I guess so. Like, what happens if the Texas economy completely crumbles and like uh, incomes and salaries plummet? Like this happened uh, mm -hmm. uh, in. <clears throat> excuse me, Southeast uh, Michigan and the Rust Belt, or North, Northern Ohio and Southeast Michigan. So uh, uh, my mother-in-law just sold their house in Southeast Michigan. And it's like that whole area is like so depressed and uh, uh, property values are like, like if you compare to the heyday of like Detroit uh, booming auto town, it's like the far end of that, that whole world has collapsed. I guess the difference oil. is that I don't really see my housing cost as like an investment so much. As far as I'm concerned, I still like literally treat it like I'm paying for an apartment like outlay every month, you know? Okay. Um, the, so another way of saying that is you're actually okay with the return on capital being zero. Like at some point, if you leave an apartment and walk away, you have nothing to show for the years of rent paid. If you walk away from this house with like nothing or almost nothing, you'd still be fine. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of, I mean, it's a little bit different than having like rented an apartment for the same amount of time, but like at the end of the day, it kind of nets out to the same. Um, so like, to me, it's like, there's a bonus option that someday maybe I will make some money back from having chosen this rather than whatever, but. Um, yeah. And I think overall Houston has more potential than like the Detroit region or something. Uh, yeah. But I guess I also, it's a yeah, I also didn't pick a house in the Detroit region. Um, <laughs> the biggest thing, the biggest risk that I worry about in the Houston area is um, flood insurance costs. But I picked a place that um, isn't close to any of the floodplains. It's never flooded, which is pretty big for Houston um, or pretty good for Houston. Um, I actually got this lake. So I have family who lives really close who owns a place very close to the waterfront um, here in town. And I, I've had a few conversations with them about moving. Um, I'm like, hey, you need to move before everyone else realizes that they need to move. Um, and basically, like, the conversation we've had about it has been, well, you know, it's getting really expensive to insure the house because we're in a place where the underwriters for housing um, insurance have decided that this area is going to be an expensive place to continue insuring. So our, in order to have a mortgage, you have to pay for, they require you to have house insurance. And if you're in a floodplain, you must have flood insurance. So, um, you know, uh, their solution to this problem isn't as you, as I would say is like, well, I'm pretty sure that insurance underwriters have a good reason for thinking it's going to be expensive for insuring this location. I should move somewhere else. That's not the logic that they've employed. Instead, they've decided that they're going to pay off their mortgage and stop having flood insurance um, as a way to reduce the costs 
of living in this place reduce the cost like these foreign like you know bodies want to impose on them um and take the whole risk that they will lose everything the money they put in their house um huh. in exchange for not paying for the flood so this is interesting because what you're saying is like we were talking about how risk is relative to the narrative you compare yourself to so in a way insurance is a model for almost um, renting out some of the possible futures to other uh, risk takers and only retaining some for yourself so you own the house in all nominal scenarios but really the insurance company owns it in some extreme disaster scenarios right like uh, that that's kind of interesting i never thought of it that way like there's one aspect of shared ownership where the bank owns the part of the mortgage that's not paid off and you own the equity that you already paid off but this is sort of an alternate way like a multiverse way of thinking about it so david deutsch angle so in universe where the flood hasn't destroyed the house you own it and if you sell it you make money or whatever but in the universe where the flood destroys the house the insurance company actually owns it and they're on the hook for like the capital exposure so uh, yeah. in a way your um, relatives and friends are planning around owning all the futures instead of just some of the future stories yeah yeah that's true yeah huh. so they've they've elected into that because it's cheaper in the short term um, and i think the irrationality that can creep in there is people are not good at guessing what will happen when sort of um how do i put it uh, risks that you can see at an individual level also have a collectivized aspect to them like it's not just that your house could get flooded everybody's house gets flooded in your neighborhood half your friends die so you don't have friends and then many of them may not be as well prepared as you and suddenly you're living in a mad max world and it's not the world you even if you survive you're not surviving in the world you thought you would be surviving in right no and that house all that money you thought you were saving yourself by paying off your house or whatever um you're never going to be able to sell that house like it's just you literally i mean this is the worst case i think this is like worse than like the south detroit or whatever your family member was selling off um because at least then there was some residual value it sounds like they probably lost money maybe on what they paid but at least they got something out if it gets condemned or if like the price of flood insurance is so expensive the most likely thing is that you can't sell the house for any amount of money then you basically lost like everything you've ever paid and then you might as yeah. well have been living in an apartment and that's uh, the outcome that's happened in parts of detroit like um, many of the sort of uh, properties have become condemned and torn down and returned to farmland so like i think detroit uh, through the last uh, decade and a half shrank by like 30% and it's kind of gone back to being more um, sort of a farmland kind of thing this is this has happened multiple times like upstate new york uh, cornell ithaca that region where i lived for several years it went through the same cycle like back when the erie canal was booming people had like lots higher expectations of how much industrial development would happen so if you go to the cities there like binghamton ithaca syracuse buffalo it's like you know rochester all of those cities you can tell that they were built and planned with Uh, the prospect of a lot more prosperous future that never materialized uh, and in a way san, san francisco what's happened post covid the crash you could say it's that kind of like crisis do i think san francisco will recover there's like good bones there i don't know yeah i don't know um what do you think the risks are for like a renter though like for renting it seems like the biggest risk you face is like kind of some amount of inflation risk in terms of having to pay more for housing like no in, inflation would uh, benefit you at least during the term of the lease right so if prices goes up and you're logged into like a particular low rent you actually win so it's actually deflation that could kill you but in either case your risk exposure is at most a year unless you're renting commercial real estate on like a 3 5 year lease or something like that so i, I don't think there's honestly in the us at least the us market is weird i don't think there's significant risk in uh, uh renting the only big risk is actually psychological because for most people uh, the house is the most uh, 
important source of both psychological security and your biggest investment asset. Like if you don't invest in a house, chances are you won't save enough for retirement. So that's kind of a way of like almost locking away your own impulses and saying, I'm not going to touch the mortgage payment. And that effectively becomes your saving. Mm -hmm. But if you're thinking of it that way and you compare, again, this is like what you compare to. So you compare San Francisco real estate to Texas. I would compare say an equivalent amount invested in like, you know, the S and P or something. That's like the right comparison to make. It's like, all right, assume you're disciplined enough to actually invest what you would put in a mortgage in a 401k instead. Mm -hmm. And in that case, which is, which looks smarter. And I would say probably the stock market looks smarter. It's definitely smarter. I've been reading a lot about retirement, um, like retirement, different perspectives on retirement planning. Um, just because I was kind of curious, you know, I'm in my early thirties. I'm just kind of curious about what that process looks like. Should I have been reading these in my 20s? Maybe, I don't know. Um, uh, but I read an interesting one about, um, yeah, uh, sorry, like totally forgot, lost my train of thought. That's fine. Um, anyways, but yeah. They the retirement, about you were, what did you read about retirement? Oh yeah, oh, oh sorry, I remember now. The thing about the, um, so the house, investing in real estate is basically, you don't, your only return on investment is like, parallel to inflation you don't get anything extra so while housing prices go up his like at least this particular author I can't remember the name of the book um the his particular perspective on it is that um by investing in real estate you're basically just like meeting inflation um like the asset itself um the only way so his whole like thing is that um basically is like a rule of thumb um and I like looking at it like monthly stuff. So I remember it was like monthly stuff. Um, basically for every thousand dollars a month you need in um, retirement, um, you need about 300K in savings to produce a thousand dollars a month. Um, and that's at a 5% rate, that's assuming a 5% rate of return after inflation. So that's like eight minus three gives you five. Um, yeah, and like that that whole model is really, ba his whole model or his whole thing is really that you want to get enough principle that you don't ever have to worry about how long you're going to live. So you can just live off the, the, you don't ever have to burn down your principle. Um, it is like very like, I think it's very like, I mean, he's talking like the ideal case of retirement, right? Um, the ideal case of retirement is that you have enough income generating assets, whether that's stuff you put in the stock market or whether that's, you know, a house you've bought and is paying off rental income. Um, so for every thousand dollars a month you get in rental income, that's $300,000 you don't need to save is his like other thing. Um, so like, yeah, so his like focus on it is really around cash flow. And he's like, look, if you get your cash flow right and you're like have income generating assets, you don't really have to worry about retirement. And I was like, oh, that's nice. Um, and for everyone else, there's this like simple rule every like, you know, like, um, oh, he had two kind of interesting things about the stock market that I don't think a lot of people talk about when they talk about retirement. Um, the first one, so there's his, well, the two, he said there's two things you really need to care about. One is what is the valuation of the stock market at the time you're looking to retire? Um, and you can do this by looking at the profit to the PDE ratio, which is profit to earnings. So if you're, he, you can kind of group it into like four different sections. Um, is the profit to earnings of a corporate of like the stock market as a whole kind of as an average is it higher than normal is it lower than normal is it somewhere in the middle and this is when you're looking to retire um if it's higher than normal when you're looking to retire that's not good that's a bad indication yeah. it could um, crash and suddenly you don't have enough yep yeah. yeah that's a good indication that the stock market is probably going to crash real soon really quickly into your retirement and you should probably do something to like pull a bunch of your stuff out of stocks, put it into like assets that like generate income or put it in bonds or tips or something um, or change your expectations around like what you're gonna withdraw in the first couple of years because you're kind of in a very dangerous territory. Um, however, if the stock market at the time you're looking to retire has is low valued, then there's a really good chance that you'll be able to like your assets will grow really well over the like beginning of your retirement and you'll be able to spend more than you think you will without worrying about running out of money. Um, and the other one that he said is I think like, what is the inflation rate kind of like, what is the rate of return minus inflation? Cause that, that's a big number. Like the inflation number is really important for figuring out like how much money you need to retire. 
uh, though inflation is kind of weird lately, it's uh, we, we should talk about that in a future episode where there seems to be this sort of bifurcated inflation in like asset prices versus living prices. And uh, they haven't updated the consumer price index to really reflect like how modern life exists. So it looks like inflation is very low, but maybe it's not really low, that kind of thing. We should talk about that sometime. Uh, I've been doing a, oh, I've been doing a series of posts on my review, my Twitter like um, newsletter about inflation. We, I just did one on real estate. Um, oh, okay. My next one's gonna be on goods and why is the price of goods not moving as much as real estate? Um, we should find a way to talk about it in one of the future letters that's not I because I is like background uh, the alphabet. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it's interesting that we started off talking about risk, but mostly ended up talking about real estate, which also is ours. So that's kind of good. Uh, risk, return, real estate. Uh, but, but there's like, that's one of the weird things about the industrial world where it sort of narrows your perspective so much. You think risk, immediately you're talking real estate, retirement, returns, and all these things. And we don't talk about all kinds of other risks, like, you know, uh, mental health risks of working in the wrong kind of job or climate risks understood as like a shared fate with where economics is sort of way to measure it, but that's not really where the crux of the matter is. Insurance so, costs are though, right? Like the environment is built into like home insurance. Um, up to a point, up to a point, like in big catastrophes, the insurance market collapses, then the reinsurance market collapses. That happened with 9-11. I think COVID has had like similar knock-on effects. And at some level, the only backstop is the government with the you know federal insurance, off insurance kind of stuff. But at some level, everything runs out of capacity, including the capacity to run money, I mean, print money. So it's like the backstops go from your personal risks to sort of the shared risks of being in a good community to the risks that are actually given away to insurance, then um, insurance and banking sector, then the risks that are backstopped by the state. And then beyond that, the risks that are backstopped by our state of knowledge in a way. Like the reason we are not as scared of like printing too much money and driving, you know, runaway inflation like uh, the Weimar Republic is that hopefully we've learned something in like a hundred years on how to manage monetary policy and stuff like that. So we think we know better than the Weimar Republic in 1920s. I'm not sure we do. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think there's some risk associated with running your money printer, right? Um, uh, I, I don't know. At some point we should talk about MMT, the modern monetary policy stuff. Like, Yeah, maybe you I can think explain it to me. Hmm? Maybe you can explain it to me. I think it's bullshit. I don't think there's anything to explain. It's like a sort of uh, fiction made up by people who kind of want an excuse to, I don't know, not think about money. It's like, uh, it's economics for people who don't want to think about money, so. Yeah, I feel like the fact that I haven't figured out what it means yet is a good indication that there's not a lot to it. Um, yeah, Emperor has no clothes. It's, I think, empty. There's, there's something in the direction of thinking, but MMT is like kind of the grifty version of what could be there. I don't know what it is. I keep coming back to like, Jane Jacobs wrote a, sh a ton about um, about money and currency and currency flows and economics and how they all like relate together. Um, in fact, I think it's some of her best work is her writings on like economics and how currencies work. Um, I haven't done too much thinking though as to how like the things she outlined apply to like MMT or running the money printer. Um, but I definitely think there's like, I definitely think there's something that we could learn from the stuff she's written or get some insight in regards to her current regime. I haven't done it yet though. Yeah, there's this, I think you talked about Jane Jacobs economics work um either this season or last season. And I was only familiar with more of her sociology work and urbanism work, but yeah, it's interesting to know she did a lot of um, economics work, uh, but it's kind of interesting. I associate her thinking with like, quote unquote, ordinary people. So like, you know, life on the street, middle-class people, working class people, you know, mingling and living together in mixed communities. Whereas money really, you have to think about rich people as well because they dominate the economy so much but are so unplugged from kind of the rest of society. And, and there's this line, I forget who said it or where I heard it, but the idea that money is for poor people. 
that thinking of risk and return and everything in terms of money is something poor people and the middle class are forced to do and have to do. But rich people don't really think of risk and return and scenarios in money terms, simply mm-hmm. because they have so much of it, they kind of manage it in other ways. Like they kind of almost, if you have enough money, you can exit the money economy. So this creates, I think, some weird moral hazards and conflicts of interest because they manage money because they own most of it and sort of own all the power that controls how it's designed, but they're not themselves exposed to the risks. Like take, you know, zombie apocalypse, the dollar collapses and Bitcoin collapses too. They're the only ones who actually will have enough hard assets in their like, you know, lairs and underground bunkers with like food for 10, 20 years and nuclear reactors for power or whatever the fuck uh, Peter Thiel has. So in a way they're outside the money economy and money is something the rich people kind of like participate in a lot and have a lot of, but primarily they ensure that it is designed for uh, the poor and the middle class, which means that the poor and the middle class kind of have to follow certain rules of money. And if they don't, the whole scheme breaks down. And that's the kind of thing that worries me about MMT. It's like a, mm-hmm. it's a very popular idea with like quasi socialist uh, people who kind of still want to live in a capitalist world. Uh, But in a way they're messing with the part of the game that's not designed to be messed with. Like if you want to mess with money, you become super rich and mess with it from outside. You don't mess with it at the level of say UBI. Right, Um, yeah. Yeah, that's my rant on MMT. Risks of the monetary system passing into the hands of the people, it sounds like. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Yeah, we should like it, it, this came across, I think, as more sort of pro capitalist and pro rich and anti poor, but uh, it's sort of a neutral comment. I, I'm talking about how the machine works. The machine was designed by some people to govern some other people with risks balanced out in a certain way. And it's just like, you know, in a car engine, if you like uh, throw a brick at the windshield, it breaks your glass and creates an ugly thing and maybe creates a dangerous situation when driving. But it's fundamentally a weaker way to attack a car than to like shove a rod into the engine or something like that or right so it's it's like messing with the riskier part of the economic engine so anyway i think we are almost out of time so our s so next week we'll be talking about some subject with an s to come something up. for next week great well as venkat it's always a pleasure talking to you about risky business um i'll catch you next week All right, see you next week. Bye. Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Great. Um, And if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.